Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is Mailbag. What is Mailbag? Well, I'm glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show to take live questions from the audience, but only if you're watching live. What happens if you watch a show one of the other 22 hours during the day, and you've got a comment, question, thought, or opinion you'd like me or Rob to share? Well, that's what we have Mailbag for. If you'd like to get a comment, question, thought, or opinion on Mailbag, simply go down to the description of this video. You'll see a tip link. Click on that there, or enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll be getting your comment or question read on Mailbag if we deem your comment or question to be appropriate to be read on the show. And of course, you're supporting this channel at the same time and all of us involved at the John Campion channel. Thank you guys so much for your support. Okay, guys, I am back from Canada, ready to do a mailbag. So let's jump into it and start getting to the questions you guys have been sending in. We're getting things started off here with Bat Ombre, who writes, Hello, movie fam. After the big numbers from Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, and unless Ezra eats someone, uh, we can expect decent numbers from Flash 2. Maybe. Is it time Superman embraced the chaos? Is it time for Mr. Mixelplex? Uh, could a more comedic Superman work? I don't think people are looking for a more comedic Superman. Um, now, I, again, at the same time, even though I think Zack Snyder's Man of Steel is a brilliant film, I think a lot of people were turned off by it being more serious than they're used to Superman being. So I think a lighter tone, but I don't think a comedic Superman. You know what I'm saying? Mr. Mixelplex, I, I don't know. It, it always reminded me a lot of the great kazoo on Fred Flintstone. I, I don't know that he would fit in there at all. I don't think audiences would be happy with him or take it seriously. So I'm going to guess no on that bat, Omri. But you never know. They can always come up with a way that works. All right, Jerome writes, what do you think is the right and wrong way to turn a good guy into a villain? Like, for example, why did Walter White turning bad work for people while people are divided on if Daenerys turning bad uh, was out of character and if it happened too fast? Well, I mean, there is no, there's no answer to that. There's no one formulaic way. You turn a bad guy or a good guy into a bad guy by doing this. That is not, there's no one way of doing it. Any way you do it, there's a way to approach it that'll work, right? No matter which approach you take, if you handle it the right way. The thing with Walter White and Breaking Bad, the, the very name of the show was Breaking Bad. Everybody knew right from the beginning that this guy was turning darker, right? That, that was always implied in the show. We always knew right from episode one, that's the direction this character is going. The name of the show is Breaking Bad. With Daenerys, again, I don't understand some of the criticism that it gets because I said on my Game of Thrones after shows for years, they are making it obvious Daenerys is going bad. It's obvious. Only everybody disagreed with me. You're crazy, John. You don't know anything. I'm telling you, Daenerys is a jerk. They're giving us all the signs. It's clear as day. She is turning villain. She's already acting villain in some ways if you pay attention. And a lot of people goes, no, 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 she's totally good. And so when the final season of Game of Thrones happened and a bunch of people were like, well, how did she turn bad out of nowhere? It's like, I was screaming at you for years that she was turning bad. And if somebody as blind as me could see it's obvious, it was there. You just didn't want to see it. So I think the turn for Daenerys worked incredibly effectively, like really, really well. Um, but if you didn't see it coming and you missed all the obvious signs that that's the way she was going, then maybe it seemed kind of sudden. But again, sudden, slow, many events leading up to it, one key single event that leads up to it, whatever. All these approaches can work if done, you know, sensitively in the right way. It's just a matter of how people want to approach it. All right. Thanks for that, Jerome. Next up, we've got also Jerome who writes in, in X-Men 2, uh, X2, Professor X almost wiped out humans and mutants with Cerebro, which makes me think uh, he could do that, which makes me think if he could do that, uh, then he could also brainwash every human and mutant to stop hating each other. Uh, why do you think he never considered doing that? I mean, listen, you're taking one event from one incarnation in one movie and trying to extrapolate an entire logic program that comes after that. First of all, 
if you try to program, if you try to force humans and mutants not to hate each other, well, then you're taking away the freedoms of humans and mutants. You're taking freedom away from the world and you're appointing yourself God. I don't think that's something that Professor X wanted to do. Plus, again, it's like anything else. You can say, okay, stop hating each other. But then the moment something else happens, somebody can start hating each other again. So it's something, it's a process he would have to repeat over and over and over again, 50, 100, 200 times a day. So it's it's the same reason why when people say, why didn't Professor X, you know, when talking about how to bring mutants into the MCU, why doesn't Prof Professor X just use his power to make everybody in the world forget mutants? Okay. But then what happens five seconds later when somewhere in Puerto Rico, a young teenage mutant manifests their powers for the first time in front of 15 people? Well, now Professor X is going to have to wipe the minds of the world again. Two seconds later, some other mutant, maybe in St. Louis, decides to rob a store using his powers and it's caught on security footage and there are witnesses. Well, now Professor X has to use his power again. And like every five to 10 seconds, Basically, Professor X would have to live in Cerebro, never sleep, never eat, and only repeat that process over and over again. So I think the same thing would be if he tried to remove the hatred uh, from it as well. But again, we're just basing that on one thing that happened in one iteration of one movie 20 years ago. So it's hard to kind of draw those lines. You know what I'm saying, Jerome? It's a good thought, though, man. All right, next up. Jerome also writes, uh, do you think Avengers Infinity War, do you think in Avengers Infinity War, Doctor Strange foresaw the emergence Eternals? And that letting the snap happen would postpone it. And on a side note, couldn't they just have cut off Thanos' hand unless Strange knew they would lose if they had tried? All right, so there's two things about that. Number one, when, per, when Doctor Strange was looking at potential outcomes, he was looking at potential outcomes of one set of circumstances. He wasn't looking at the potential set of outcomes from everything going on on the entire planet with every human being everywhere. So I don't think he was looking. I think that would have taken him a decade sitting there doing this rather than a few seconds, right? So I think we can put that aside. He didn't see the emergence coming. Otherwise, he would have been a big dick for never telling, even after the snap was done, telling the world, oh, by the way, guys, there's a giant monster living in the center of the earth and in about... Three months, he's going to emerge and destroy the planet, right? So clearly he didn't know about that. As far as cutting off um, Thanos' hand, how? Everybody through, in Infinity War, you had Drax, you had Spider-Man, you had Star-Lord, you had, uh, who else? You, have? you Obviously you had Iron Man, you had um, Gamora's sister, Nebula there. They all threw everything they could. Adam. And what was the result? One tiny cut. All that effort for a drop of blood. If them throwing everything at him could only result in one little tiny cut, what did they have at their disposal that was going to cut off his hand? I mean, yeah, if Thor had been there with Stormbreaker, Stormbreaker clearly could have severed something off him because, you know, it's Stormbreaker. But other than that, they threw everything they possibly had at him and could only manage one little cut on his face. So we could say, why didn't they just cut off his hand? Because what did they have that could cut off his hand? Probably nothing at that moment. Anyway, good question, Jerome. Okay, next up. Jade uh, Ozma Ashwood writes in, has there been any news on the Waterworld show? Deadline reported that the follow-up series would pick up with the film's characters 20 years later, and there was rumors of a deal with Peacock. Have you heard anything since? I have heard nothing of a Waterworld show. Like nothing. I, rem I think I remember these initial reports that came out, but honestly, it could be ready to start shooting. It could be, it could have been scrapped two years ago. I mean, I just don't know. I haven't heard anything about it. And to be honest with you, is anybody wanting a water world thing i mean the movie itself was not received so well i mean there's been the big attraction at universal studios hollywood i mean that's been there and that's kind of popular but has anybody been looking for it? yeah so but basically jade bottom line for me i haven't heard anything about it but if i do we'll definitely talk about it on the show thanks for writing that in jade appreciate that all right next up we've got 1.21 jello watts writes if we dream 
of our multiverse selves, then I feel horrible for the other 1.2, pardon one, the other 1.2 ones out there. Many are being chased by crazy creatures, falling forever or trapped in a bed, unable to move. A couple are getting pretty lucky though. One can even fly. Of course, without, I mean, this isn't an important thing, but in, in Doctor Strange 2, most of you know this, they, they speculate that your dreams are actually you having a vision of your self in other dimensions. So if you're running from a clown in in a dream, that means that there's a version of you in another dimension that's running from a clown. So 1.21 gigawatts is wondering what his alternates are up to. All right, Victor Movie Fan writes, Hey crew, May 14th, 1948 is the anniversary of the rebirth of a nation of Israel. Uh, a movie I love to watch is Defiance. Have you seen it? And what are your thoughts on the film? Now, if that's the one with Daniel Craig. Yeah, I remember that was that was actually quite a good movie. I don't know if that's the actual movie we're talking about. Uh, but if it's the one with Daniel Craig, I remember quite liking it. I mean, I, I didn't love it. It didn't end up in my like top 10 films of the year or anything like that, but it was one that I actually quite enjoyed. Hey guys, we want to take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, Athletic Greens. Now, when you get really busy, and you guys know that Ann and I are really busy, one of the first things that you sacrifice is eating healthy. And you know, I simply have never eaten enough vegetables in my diet, I admit it. So for a long time, I've been looking for a really good all-in-one supplement that helps me get those nutrients and vitamins that my body needs. And thank goodness, I found Athletic Greens AG1. So what is Athletic Greens AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods and probiotics to help you start your day right. And for me and Ann, it's easy. We get up in the morning, we pour a big glass of water and add one scoop of AG1. So many people today are taking some kind of multivitamin and it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. And it's cheaper than getting all those different supplements yourself. And on top of giving you all those vitamins and nutrients, it also supports better sleep and quality of recovery and supports mental clarity and alertness. Right Right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash mailbag. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash mailbag to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And a big thank to Athletic Greens for sponsoring this episode of Mailbag. Guys, make sure you do give Athletic Greens AG1 a shot. Ann and I did. Ann's now addicted to it. It really helps me out a lot. I think you'll enjoy it as well. Check their link down in the description of this video below and don't forget to use that code mailbag all right guys let's get back over to it here shall we we're gonna get things picked up here with cody stevens who writes what do you think about the upcoming one piece live action tv show and animated movie no thoughts at all i know one piece is extremely popular i have never watched a single frame of it to be honest with you i don't know if i've ever even looked at a poster of it to be honest with you so unfortunately for me you know i'm sure chris carr would have something interesting to say about this could but unfortunately for myself but i will say this though I know that One Piece has got a lot of fans around the world, and so it's always really exciting when they get new content like this coming out. So I think it's great, even though I myself don't actually know anything about it. Hey, anyway, thanks for writing that in, Cody. Appreciate that. All right, next up, we get one from Bames John, who sends in like a $20 tip. Thank you, Bames, for supporting our channel on that level. And Bames writes, Hey guys, great show today. Well, this probably would have been the other day. So I was initially on a Sam Neill movie binge, which then led me to the movie Possession, directed by uh, Andrzej Zulowski. So many emotion watching that movie. Any of you seen any Zulowski movies? And what do you, and, and did you like them? I, I'll be honest with you. I'm not familiar with, I mean, I've heard his name, but I am not familiar with any of his like uh, films and his works like right off the top of my head. I mean, I'll watch anything with Sam Neill, but unfortunately, yes, uh, Andrzej's name is not one that I'm really familiar with. I think he did like most of his films were done in Poland and things like that. I'm not really sure, but not familiar with most of his movies, unfortunately. Thanks. But you put that on the radar for a lot of people now, Bame. So thanks for that, dude. And again, thank you for supporting our channel on that level, dude. That's really generous of you, man. All right. Next up, Rob's Blu-ray collection writes. 
My son was born in 2003. Every movie I have taken him to see, I saved every ticket, oh, that's nice, and wrote which friends was with him. I recently built a wooden box shaped like a movie ticket so he will always have those memories to look back on. Dude, that is one of the coolest things I've ever heard a parent doing for their child. And now your child is like 19 years old, but that is incredibly special. I have a friend of mine named Chris who, and this was like, a decade ago, he showed me he had this big bag of every movie ticket stub. This giant bag just filled with every movie stick. No organization to it at all. But if your son doesn't even know about this and someday you just present that to him, that is a really cool gift, man. And very creative. Well thought out, man. All right, next up. Scott Brown writes, uh, just occurred to me that between your spoiler talk and mailbag, I sent, I spent like 50 bucks complaining about a movie I didn't like in Dr. Strange. I remember that Scott, uh, but uh, I love the show. So that's okay. That being said, I have more thoughts after the spoiler window is up. Yeah. I remember Scott writing in like, 10 questions about all these things they hate about Doctor Strange. And that's the great thing about these movies, right? The great thing about the movies is, is that no matter how good or bad you think it is, there are tons of other people with different perceptions. We all experience movies differently. We all have our own unique experience with the movie. It, it, movies all hit us in different ways. And while some people think Doctor Strange 2 is completely outstanding, there are some people who think it's totally awful and then a million people somewhere in the middle, right? And that's the great thing about movies that we have these different experiences. And I'm glad you shared yours. Scott, I appreciate that, man. Thanks for writing that in. All right, next up. Uh, Luke, I am your plumber, writes. R.I.P. Fred Ward. I was first introduced to him in the movie Uncommon Valor. Also with Fred Ward uh, was Gene Hackman and Tex Cobb. But I'll never forget when, uh, when Fred ordered and ate the raw hamburger in that movie. Also, have you ever seen it and what did you think? Yeah, I was very sad and shocked, honestly, to hear about the passing of Fred Ward. I mean, listen, when I think of Fred Ward, I know a lot of people will think of Tremors and, and, and that's great. Nothing wrong with and, and a lot of his others. But for me... Fred Ward will always be Remo Williams. Remo Williams, The Adventure Begins, is one of my all-time guilty pleasure favorite movies. With him and I believe uh, the other guy was Chun. I believe it was the other dude. Uh, Wilford Brimley uh, was, was in that movie as well. I loved Remo Williams. I honestly don't know why that didn't come a big franchise. It was a big book series, but I was really, really sad to hear about his passing. Luke, thanks for writing that in, man. All right, next up. Nathan writes, Hey, John or Rob, just John here. Uh, while it is still unknown who's going to be playing the Fantastic Four when they come to the MCU, I would personally love to see David Tennant and Rosamund Pike play Reed Richards and Sue Storm, respectively. Yeah, you know what I'm going to say, right? I don't, I don't care. Like, I, I don't care who plays the role. All I care about is who, do, who they pick. Are they good actors? Are they good actors? That's all I care about. Because I don't know if a certain actor is a good fit for the role or not, because I don't know what they're going to make their Sue Storm or Reed Richards like in the movie, right? Like, look at the different Jokers we had. The uh, the Dark Knight Joker was completely different from the Tim Burton Joker, which was completely different from the uh, 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 Zack Snyder Joker, which is completely different from the Joaquin Phoenix Joker. I mean, they're all the Joker, so you think you know the Joker, right? But the thing is, every single filmmaker and storyteller has their own slight different variation interpretation of the Joker. And so he comes out completely different in each of those movies. Therefore, a different person, you know, is the right fit and you just can't know. Like, since you haven't read the script and I haven't read the script, I don't know who would be the right fit. So I'll leave the right fit up to them. All I want to see is a good actor. But I will say this. David Tennant is clearly a good actor. Rosamund Munn Pike is one of the most underrated actresses in the entire business. So those are two would certainly be two different names that would get my attention if they were cast for that. Uh, anyway, Nathan continues to write, uh, there are many reasons why neither of them would be likely to take their respective roles. Uh, no, they would jump at it. Uh, but it would be amazing if in some unforeseen set of circumstances, they actually did get cast. Nothing is truly official until we hear it from Kevin Feige. And I just wanted to share my thoughts before it's too late. Well, again, like I said, no idea if they're the right fit. They, I mean, once we see the movie or if we were to read the script, we might go, oh my God, Rosamund Pike and David Tennant are totally wrong for this role. But again, we won't know that. All I know is that they're both really good actors. So if they get cast, it'll definitely get my attention, Nathan. Thanks for sharing that, man. All right, next up. 
Jerome writes, why do you think fans feel they know who a character is better? Let me see, try this again. Why do you think fans feel they know who a character is better than the people who write for the created or, hmm, for or created the character, for example, how they uh, reacted to a decision by characters like Luke in The Last Jedi, Superman in Man of Steel, uh, Daenerys in Game of Thrones. Well, again, this comes, this is a habit I think all film fans have, me included, you included. We all have this tendency, it just expresses itself in different ways. And that is a tendency of we feel we have ownership over a character. Every movie fan feels like they have ownership over a character they love, and every movie fan thinks they know what would be the best thing to happen to that character. And unfortunately, what happens is when a movie goes in a different direction than what we think should happen or what we expect to happen, sometimes we dismiss it out of hand. Even if it's great, even if it's great, a lot of us will just reject it instantly because, well, they should have done this, right? Like one kind of an example of that is like Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films, right? Some, a trilogy that are amongst the most celebrated movies of all time, but didn't have Tom Bombadil in it. Now, for those people, the millions and millions and millions of people who never read the books, you may be going, I've never even heard of Tom Bombadil. Well, Tom Bombadil is a character in the books. Not a super prominent character, but a character and a notable character in the books. And because, you know, a lot of fans, well, if he's in the book, he should have been in the movies. And if you don't put him in the movies, it's stupid. And believe me, I have heard from people over the, the decades that just refuse to acknowledge anything good about Lord of the Rings because Tom Bombadil wasn't there. And that's just an example. So, you're, and, and, and like I said, we have all been guilty of this, myself included. We have all been guilty of that or something like that at some point or another. With some people, it's like, I don't think Luke should have done that. Well, he did. And, and because they don't like the decision, they, they wanted to see Luke something different. And when it didn't match up to what it was they wanted to see, they reject it. Now, by the way, a lot of people just watch the movie without any expectations and just the movie didn't work for them and they didn't, the, the decisions made by certain characters didn't work for them. And that's perfectly legitimate. Nothing wrong with that in the world. But some people, and again, we all do it. We're just like, they wanted to see Luke something, do something different in the movies. And when he didn't kind of got upset about it and, uh, and kind of rejected the movie out of hand. All right. Next up, Boris writes. Hey, Rob. Obviously, Rob's not here today. Um, I'm sad you didn't like Strange New Worlds. I really thought uh, it might get you. When you said Anson Mount for Reed Richards, I was like, damn, I want that now. Uh, you two also look You two also look strikingly alike when you smirk. <laughs> you guys killed it on Friday, too. Yeah, Friday and Monday. Like, the, the, the crew did such a great job while I was away. Rob in the main host chair on Friday and then Chris in the main host chair on Monday. Uh, and by the way, Chris was going to host Monday even if Rob was there, like Rob didn't find out that he had tested positive for COVID until he was already in the parking lot. Like he got a call from his girlfriend while he was in the parking lot, getting ready to come up and do the show. That's when he got called, but Chris was going to host that day anyway. But oh, the, my lights just kind of turned out. I think it's, there's a motion thing in here. Did it catch my motion? No. Anyway, the lights turned out. That's fine. We're almost wrapped up here anyway. Um, but yes, so Chris was going to do that show and Chris and Rob both did such a terrific job in my absence. It was the first time ever in the almost five years of doing the John Campia show that a John Campia show happened without John Campia. And that has a lot to do with how great of a job Rob and both and Chris and, and Ray, obviously, and probably most importantly, Jonathan Voico, producer Jonathan, who, you know, Without before, without me there, there could never be a show because I also ran everything. I ran the camera switching, the audio, the graphics, all all the trends. I had to do everything while hosting the show. And now producer Jonathan is there doing that, which means other people can host, and it's been great, and and I love it. Uh, anyway, guys, there are more questions to come. Uh, we've still got more from uh, Mike G, uh, Jerome, Dirt on My Boot. I love that name. Uh, more to come and all that kind of stuff. But that's all the time I have for right now. I've actually got to run to a meeting uh, in Los Angeles. So I've got, I've got to go and get that meeting. There will be another mailbag tomorrow. We will get all caught up on all the remaining questions, plus any new questions you guys send in. So if you've got questions you want to send in for me to answer tomorrow, send them on in using the tip link below, and we will get to those on tomorrow's mailbag. All right, guys. Guys, that will do it for me for now. Thanks so much for joining me. It's so dark in here now. Thanks a lot for joining me. My name's John Campia. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.